Welcome to Conscious and Unconscious Bias in Urban Planning. Now we have a word from our sponsor, Mr. Dwight Williams with Gallagher Insurance. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Dwight Williams, Vice President and Regional Co-Lead for the Inclusion and Diversity Committee at Gallagher. For those of you who don't know, Gallagher is a global leader in insurance, risk management, and consultant services. At our core, we help people and communities at risk by offering sound solutions to identify, mitigate, and manage risk. By accessing markets around the globe, Gallagher has the ability to influence the welfare of people in a really powerful way. But along with that, we have a responsibility to do so in a very thoughtful and ethical way. Unfortunately, that's not the case for all organizations. Throughout history, and even today, unfortunately, businesses and governments advance certain economic agendas while pushing humanitarian issues to the side. In urban areas across the country, we see cities developing and revitalizing, but at the expense of their black and brown neighborhoods. Being a native Brooklyn, New Yorker myself, I've unfortunately witnessed firsthand gentrification and displacement of my own family members who had resided in those neighborhoods for generations. Things like predatory lending and redlining continue to disproportionately affect our marginalized community. Racial bias in urban planning is clearly a persistent issue, but the first step in righting yesterday's wrongs and course correcting for the future is acknowledging the truth, unmasking the realities around us. That's why we've partnered with the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center to bring this topic to the forefront. When business leaders can work within the community in forums of dialogue and knowledge sharing, then and only then do we begin the journey of healing, progressing and building stronger communities for everyone, especially communities of color. So on behalf of Gallagher, I'd like to thank the center, today's presenters and our listeners for their willingness to participate in this very critical conversation. Thank you. I'll turn your attention now to Christopher Miller for some context around today's event. Thank you, Dwight. And thank you, Gallagher Insurance, as well as our community partners, Design Impact and Calibrated Lens. O.W. Gurley was born on, on Christmas Day in 1868 in Huntsville, Alabama. He was a first generation freedman. His parents were formerly enslaved prior to the end of the Civil War. He was self-educated and eventually married his childhood sweetheart, Emma. In 1893, Gurley participated in the Cherokee Outlet Land Rush and staked a claim in Perry Noble County. In 1905, Gurley and his wife sold their property in Noble County and moved 80 miles to the oil boom town of Tulsa. Gurley purchased 40 acres of land in North Tulsa and established his first business, a rooming house on a dusty road that would become Greenwood Avenue. He subsided, he subdivided his plot into residential and commercial lots and eventually opened a grocery store. As the community grew around him, Gurley prospered. Between 1910 and 1920, the Black population in the area he had purchased grew from 2,000 to nearly 9,000 in a city with a total population of 72,000. The Black community had a large working class population, as well as doctors, lawyers, and other professionals who provided services to them. Soon, the Greenwood District was dubbed Black Wall Street by Booker T. Washington. Gurley, should not only be remembered as one of the wealthiest men in our history, but an innovator in urban planning in the service of Black folk. 100 years ago, this thriving community was destroyed through anti-Black violence, and it still hasn't recovered today. Now we will have a short video, a trailer, Descendants from the Promised Land. There is this quote by John Hope Franklin. There are two ways which whites destroy a black community. One is by building a freeway through it. The other is by changing its zoning laws. 
The cutting off of the legacy, the cutting off of intergenerational wealth, that is what the 1921 massacre did to the black community. And still some people were resilient enough after that to rebuild. And that was destroyed by redistricting, rezoning, eminent domain, taking property from businesses. I mean, that's what happened to my great grandmother's building. The city bought it because everything around it was being gentrified. Kind of the common theme, unfortunately, that's happened in a lot of the black communities across the United States. We will never have a real scale of all the businesses and all the companies of Black Wall Street when it was absolutely at its best. Black Wall Street went on for miles and miles. Now it's a little block. There are Black-owned businesses on that street, but it's been gentrified. My sister and I talk about this all the time. What if? the massacre didn't happen at all. Would this have been a business that kept going in our family? Could it have been a legacy? The possibilities are absolutely endless. Would Black Wall Street had an influence on the entire nation? So it's critical 100 years later that we not forget about Black Wall Street and the families and the impact that the devastation of the massacre that took place. There are lessons for us to learn from that. And so joining me uh, as we continue this conversation is Josh Poe. He is the co-founder and co-principal investigator at the Root Cause Research Center in Louisville, Kentucky. He is an urban planner, community organizer, and geographer with over 20 years of scholarship, activism, and practical experience. Thank you for joining us here today, Josh. Thank you for having me. Really glad to be here. Really appreciate the invitation. Absolutely. As I said, you visited our city here in Cincinnati a few years back and you did a wonderful presentation. And so I definitely want to have a, a conversation with you to discuss confronting racism in city planning and zoning. Um, through your research, uh, you illuminate how critical it is for us to have a greater understanding of how racial segregation ordinance have had generational impact. Uh, can you share details about Harlan Bartholomew and how his efforts uh, sparked a legacy of racial segregation across uh, the nation? Yes. And so to answer that, I'm going to try to be brief. And, and I think it's so important to note that Bartholomew was really the architect behind things like single family zoning, street design, and really what became the urban renewal policies in the 1949 Housing Act and 1956 Interstate Highway Act, Highway Act. Bartholomew was also a key advisor on the Hoover Commission on Zoning that operated between 1921 and 1924. And that commission was so important because they really codified what we call racial capitalism uh, by making it a factor in real estate values. And so by tying race to real estate values and real estate science, it means the market is now racialized. And that's what we mean by, by racial capitalism, just that, that, that the racial identity of a person reflects some economic value. And so in order to really understand the kind of the origins of city planning and where Bartholomew came out of and the thinking he came out of, we really have to go back to Herbert Hoover's work in mining. Uh, and because Herbert Hoover was the Secretary of Commerce throughout the, the 20s, and he got his start managing mining operations. And Hoover believed that he could increase the labor productivity of white workers if there were a counterweight, as he called it. And that counterweight weight was racialized. And this is where the idea of holding one group of people who are worse off has potential labor replacement came from. And so in the mid 1890s, Hoover goes to Australia to manage a gold mine there. And there's a strike. 
And Hoover writes back to his superiors about how he's going to handle a strike. And he said that mixed labor is advantageous in a mine. He said, I have a bunch of Italians coming into work and I will secure them, hold the property in case of a general strike and I will reduce wages. So that worked. And so the, the industrial capitalists and industrial leaders of that time uh, really took a liking to this because not only did he break a strike, he reduced wages. So that made him a really hot commodity among these group of miners around the world. He went around the globe managing mines, using racialized labor as a, what he called a counterweight. And so in the redlining maps that came out in the 1930s, they all said the same thing. They said mixed neighborhoods destabilized markets. And I think a lot of scholars take that to mean that they are afraid of racial strife that might exist in those neighborhoods and that somehow translate to market destabilization. I, I think from my research and from other research that, that the point of that was to destroy any cross-racial solidarity that was existing between the working class at that time because the strikes destabilized the market, meaning they cut the profits of industrial capitalism. And so I'm from Appalachia and I know, you know, we know from studying coal mine management that when black workers were brought in to work in the mines in the later part, in the early part of the last century, largely again to break strikes that coal operators would build their homes and schools completely separate. And this influenced our housing model and really influenced what we think of as segregation and really why we have segregation. And so labor policy really created housing policy. Labor needed new ways to manage workers in the early part of the last century and the ruling class what they call, applied what they called scientific management techniques to labor management, housing and communities. And this came to be known as urban planning. That's really where urban planning came from. And so new management systems were needed as we shifted from as we shifted to an from an economy based on slave labor to a, an, an industrial economy under liberal capitalism. We needed a new way to control our workers and we needed a new housing system design. And so Hoover took over real estate, immigration, labor, zoning and housing policy during this time. In 1917, uh, over five million workers went on strike. Uh, and uh, Own Your Own Home campaign was launched by the National Association of Real Estate Boards that Trump that really championed home ownership. And one of the reasons they championed home ownership is because they said homeowners don't go on strike. If you can lock someone into a 30 year mortgage, much less likely to go on strike. So and this campaign was later taken over by the by Hoover and the Department of Labor, and they really pushed home ownership and the idea that the American dream was deeply linked in government policies that favored mortgages over rent payments. And, and Hoover promoted homeownership and segregation, believing that if we had, uh, 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 if, if someone had an equity stake in this country, they would be much less likely to fall under the spell of communism and labor unions. Now this is during the Red Scare. And so Hoover worked closely with the National Association of Real Estate Boards to establish a division of housing in 1921 and went on to establish and support the Better Homes in America campaign. And so by my, 1930, this is really where we get redlining policies and what that came out of. And so I think it's so important when we think about zoning, we think about racial covenants, we think about interstate highways, they were all designed within this industrial setting uh, to keep black people in very low wage positions. And those low wages for black people translated to very high profits for the industrial powers at that time. And it was also very effective in keeping black people out of labor unions. So what you are assessing is, is something I think a lot of uh, black people have felt, uh, but really didn't have the, uh, I guess you would say, uh, the actual pinpoint, the knowledge that this is intentional. Um, this is very intentional as far as the zoning and the redlining, and it's very strategic uh, in, 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 in that being said. And so it has had these lasting effects, right? Because you're talking about 1917, you're talking about the early 20th century, um, but we're still dealing with the, the lasting effects of that. Would you agree? Most definitely. And, and really what that did, you know, now everything exists within this racialized market. So now everything that comes out of the market is now racialized. And so, uh, and I think we focus a lot on zoning and redlining as if they're aberrations or outlier, outliers that aren't just a part of a link in a long chain that begins with chattel slavery and that now we see uh, uh, with gentrification today and police violence. Um, Robin uh, D.G. Kelly did an interview about the 1921 Tulsa massacre 
and he talked about whiteness holding up a mirror to itself. And he, he talked about if we hold up a mirror to whiteness, we only get to see what's on the surface. And what we really need is an x-ray machine and not a mirror to examine these things. So there were many mechanisms used to segregate people, banish black people, rob black people of land access, such as zoning, redlining, racialized covenants, but also the threat of mob violence. And so when we apply the same lens to today, we, we, we see that you know, black communities serve a, a different purpose right now than they did in an industrial economy. And so we're, we're finished with an industrial economy. And so as we move from an industrial economy to a real estate based economy, black land has really replaced black labor as the mechanism for white wealth creation. And these policies that we're seeing around gentrification, such as displacement, uh, sharp increases in houselessness, development, development driven policing are all just as devastating as anything that happened during redlining and urban renewal, if not extremely more so. And so we have to acknowledge that all these things take place within the logic of the market and that what's happening today is that we're building market rate housing in low income neighborhoods. You know, in the video clip, they said there are two things that, that, that are done to destroy black communities. And that's the interstate highway and that's the, uh, um, that's zoning. I would say the third thing today is that by building market rate housing in low income communities, that's really the, the, the redlining of today. And so, you know, the, and, the, and the difference then is that black people had a place to go. Pete White, who's the director of LA CAN says that, that banishment is different from displacement and that in displacement, people have somewhere to go, but in banishment, people have nowhere to go except jail or death. And we don't, we don't, you know, we don't have to burn crosses on people's yards or put up a, 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 a sign that says no black people allowed because the price on the for sale sign is really serving the same purpose. You know, when you have two bedroom homes that are selling for 350,000 and then you have a situation where black people have been locked out of generational wealth all this time, the market is really the mechanism that's banishing people and, and segregating people today. Wow, I mean, that that is a, you, you are definitely unmasking um, the realities of, of, of what's been going on in a lot of major cities. Uh, I will say, uh, we, we placed in the chat a link to provide some backdrop information. Um, and so I definitely want to, to thank you for joining us. You're going to stay on with us, uh, Josh. And so we're going to convene with everyone else. Um, uh, but at this time, I want to bring Jennifer Ingram into the conversation as we continue. Uh, Jennifer is the founder and CEO of Calibrated Lens, a boutique consulting firm with the mission of inspiring clients to facilitate sustainable change centering on equity and inclusion. Uh, previously, she served as the Vice President of Diversity and Equity Inclusion at the United Way of Greater Cincinnati. Uh, Jennifer is the also the founder and CEO, CEO of 3011 Whitney, a real estate investment company. Thank you for joining us, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. It's an honor to have been invited. Absolutely. Had to bring you on. You actually introduced me to Josh, and I'm just constantly amazed by the information that he provides, um, the history. Um, which is so, so important. Um, but um, I want to look through multiple lenses as we continue this conversation. And so, but first of all, can you share um, some information behind uh, 311 Whitney and the realities of home ownership along racial lines? I will let everyone know if you saw our, uh, if you saw our graphic for this program, uh, that is Jennifer in front of 311 Whitney. So could you tell us a little bit more about that? Absolutely. And I want to just say how uh, humbling it was uh, that that selection was made to use that image for this program. Uh, I, I believe that when the past is present is an important way to frame this story. Uh, I sit here in 2021, uh, owner, founder and CEO of, of 3011 Whitney. But before uh, there was a real estate investment company, there was a, a young couple in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and those were my great grandparents. Uh, after witnessing their neighbor uh, uh, be nearly murdered uh, for starting a business, hauling items uh, in the community for other black folks, uh, white folks came to his home and again, nearly killed this man. 
Uh, shortly thereafter, my great grandfather said, I'm not the type of man that could live in the South. And that uh, still rings true and echoes the sentiments that he shared with me as a little girl when I used to ask grandpa, why did you guys leave Mississippi when your home was there, your family was there. Uh, and, and now looking at them settling as refugees uh, in the city of Detroit, Michigan. I think that when we talk about the great migration, it minimizes the experiences of black people that were fleeing terror in the South and a Jim Crow South at that. And so my great grandparents settled in Detroit, Michigan with very little. They lived in a one room apartment for years uh, uh, while they saved up money to, to be able to purchase a property. And I remember my great grandmother using the term chinches. She said, we lived in this one room uh, bed. We had to put the bed up. It was a fold down bed. We had to put it up to even be able to cook in the kitchen. And there were chinches that would come out and bite you at night. It looked clean, but there were chinches. And I just always said, Paul, what are you, you know, little bed bugs. And I had to actually do some deeper research. And chinches is actually a Spanish term uh, for bed bugs. And so I did some deeper uh, research and found that uh, before there were Blacks that settled in Detroit, there were uh, Hispanic folks that came and were brought in as laborers. And so they were subject to the same deplorable conditions that my great grandparents were subjected to uh, trying to establish themselves and, and really uh, identify a platform for their family to have greater opportunity in the future. It was after a few years of them having uh, uh, lived in that small one room uh, 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 apartment that they were able to save up and purchase uh, 3011 Whitney. And I would say that as it as we think about communities, and for us, I grew up in that home. That was my family's home. Uh, that was where my, my uh, great uncle came home from the hospital to that home. And I came, uh, my mom and uh, uh, I came to that home. And it was a home that was very rich in love. But uh, uh, very similarly, uh, it was not rich in uh, uh, generational opportunity uh, as an investment vehicle. Why? Because of many of the things that Josh discussed earlier. When we think about how communities were designed and my great grandparents that saved up to purchase that home thinking that that would be an asset to their family for generations to come. Uh, when you look at the decline of communities and the underinvestment and divestment in communities, it's happening in Louisville as Josh referenced. It's happening here in Cincinnati and it happened in Detroit. This is a national problem. This is a global uh, pandemic that really is one that requires immediate attention. And for me and my fiance, we got a bit frustrated in waiting for uh, 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 development corporations to come into neighborhoods and create access to high quality, affordable housing. My fiance is from Alabama and she said, you know, I've always had this dream of uh, owning real estate. And after purchasing our first home, we decided to start a real estate investment company to purchase uh, and uh, rehab properties uh, to offer high quality, affordable housing. And so I would say that the backstory was one built in legacy and pride and community and home ownership, and one that continues for us to maintain and move forward that legacy of communities, which I think we really don't spend enough time talking about, uh, which I'm happy to talk about more uh, moving forward. So it sounds like you are continuing to do a little bit of the same work that O.W. Gurley did, right? Uh, creating uh, um, uh, a place of home for yourself, but also providing for others in, in the community. So um, absolutely, we, we need more of that. You know, uh, I, it occurred with the Harlem Renaissance. I, I read about, you know, how uh, that undertaking, how the Harlem Renaissance uh, started with real estate, <laughs> you know. Um, and so um, you've made remarkable contributions uh, regarding uh, racial healing initiatives and matters related to the LGBTQ plus community. Um, <clears throat> Can you uh, take the time to unmask one or two of the most critical concerns um, confronting marginalized communities regarding equity and inclusion as we continue this conversation about city planning and development? Absolutely, and I appreciate this question so much. Um, when we organized the, the LGBT Center discussion at the Freedom Center a couple of years back, it was really around intersectionality. And so I would say that uh, first and foremost, it's understanding that no group is a monolith. No dimension of identity uh, is in isolation of others. And when you look at uh, people that are uh, from a, a racial or ethnic underrepresented group and you add on additional layers of complexity around those dimensions of identity, such as being LGBTQ+, such as being uh, 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 differently abled, such as being veterans that you know could come home with uh, PTSD and other dimensions of uh, cognitive impairment or 
physical impairment, you then start, start a, a chain reaction of furthering those fro folks from access beyond stopping with physical access, it's access to community and bringing people together and having a, a, a value that you experience uh, of your neighbor and knowing your neighbor and having a, a sense of understanding of what it means to build and strengthen communities. We can all live in a neighborhood or in six city blocks, but are we a community is the question. Do you know that person? Do you know their challenges, their desires, their aspirations? So I would say that first and foremost, it's having a degree of understanding of each other and moving beyond pleasantries to really understanding and being in community with each other and building community uh, and being vulnerable in that process and also really that, realizing that safety is relative. And for several folks from marginalized communities, it is unsafe. Uh, and so how do we start to have discussions uh, to talk about inequities uh, of groups, but moving beyond uh, a monolithic view of those uh, challenges and realizing that they're different, but they are all very much so rooted in systems of oppression uh, and how we are, uh, 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 and no pun intended, you know, leveraging master's tools to attempt to dismantle the house. Wow. Now that's a, now that's a statement. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I want you to stay with us, um, Jennifer, as we continue this conversation. Um, and, and so I want to have the opportunity to bring our next uh, panelist on, um, uh, Mr. Oz Davis III. Uh, he is the founder of Oz Davis and Associates, where he has consulted for municipalities, nonprofit agencies, large uh, issues, political candidate campaigns, developers, anchor institutions, advising their clients towards the best community relation approaches. Uh, this is a man who loves, I will repeat in all caps, this is a man who loves his community. He loves people. Uh, he's always at the forefront of bringing about constructive change. Thank you for joining us here today, uh, Mr. O.Z. Davis III. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. And it's an honor to be here. And I tell you, um, you know, Josh Poe and, and Jennifer Ingram, uh, they brought absolute fire to the conversation. And uh, I appreciate, you know, the Freedom Center and Gallag Gallagher for uh, hosting us in this significant conversation. And I hope we continue to drive home the importance of us being intentional and in unmasking these, uh, uh, these vicious realities. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I want us to talk a little bit about the legacy of displacing families. And we've, we've had somewhat of a, a, a conversation about this. And this is not only, we're in Cincinnati and so uh, this is, Cincinnati uh, centered, but it happens across other countries as well. I mean, other uh, uh, cities as well in the nation. Um, so uh, here in Cincinnati, we have the TQL Stadium, which is a soccer specific stadium in Cincinnati. Um, it's, it is the home of the FC Cincinnati uh, soccer team, which is a part of Major League Soccer. Uh, the West Insight was chosen in 2018 through a land swap with the Cincinnati Public Schools. Uh, to many, this was just another incident of displacing residents and school resources in a predominantly black community. And so my question to you, is that an accurate perspective of the situation or is there more to the story uh, from your involvement? Well, I think it's both uh, an accurate uh, perception and it's also more to the story. So when we think about and I, I wasn't quite yet on the school board. I actually was appointed to the school board right after the stadium decision was made. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons that uh, board member Lannis Timmons, uh, who I replaced on the school board resigned was because of just how difficult a decision it was for the school board uh, to swap land with FC. Now, the school didn't actually lose any resources. As a matter of fact, the school board made a good deal. They got a new stadium across the street and they got $10 million uh, to benefit the school district. The stadium, if nothing more, is a gross imposition on top of the neighborhood. I'm at Taft every day. And when you drive up and this monstrosity is like right next to you. It's, uh, it's definitely a, a daily imposition. Now, I think Josh's point in regards to uh, black land, 
being the new black labor uh, it is, is such a, a very significant point it, because that's what we're seeing here in Cincinnati and across the country where black land is now more valuable. It, it, coming back to the city is now, um, you know, the thing to do. And even at Seven Hills Neighborhood House, who is the uh, resident uh, CDC in the West End, they, they're, they're grappling with how to ensure the FC stadium will be a benefit for the neighborhood. So in the West End, about uh, 80% of uh, residents are renters. And when you have a large amount of renters, displacement is a for surety. <laughs> it's coming. Uh, houses, pr housing prices went up uh, $100,000 in two years in the West End. And there, there are uh, West End properties on the SLS at $700,000. So you, you know that displacement is coming and it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's sad to see. But let me say this uh, on the positive side of what FC has tried to do. And I've met with FC, I'm very familiar with, uh, you know, Mark Mallory and Kate and Jack and their team there and the uh, community council and FC uh, in their negotiation for the benefits agreement. There's a community benefits agreement. They've done a, as, as best a job as they could at trying to address some of the residents' concerns. That, um, that came from mass protests. It, it should have it came in the beginning. It shouldn't have had to take protests and I think a lot of times when we see the developments like this, if we would be more uh, communicative and uh, you know more planned, intentional to address concerns prior to them happening, we wouldn't feel as bad. But that wouldn't that wouldn't change the fact that this is a major project that's going to cause major displacement in the West End. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, it, it's definitely has been a hot topic. Um, in, in our city, I've seen the stadium. The stadium, I will say, is beautiful. I mean, it's, but as you said, it is large. And I don't know if you can imagine having home or living next to uh, a stadium. It, it, it is, it, I can see it being very imposing uh, and intimidating. Um, and I've driven past it and, I'm, and it commands your attention every time you drive past it. Um, beautiful, uh, but yes, I can understand how the challenge uh, with that. I want us to make sure that we have the same uh, playing field because we've mentioned gentrification. And sometimes I think people, um, May, may use it incorrectly. So I want to make sure I wanted to do, do my due diligence to, to kind of un, unmask that a little bit so that I understand. Gentrification is defined as a housing, economic, and health issue that affects a community's history and culture and reduces social capital. It often shifts a neighborhood's characteristics, racial, ethnic composition, and household income by adding new stores and resources in previously depleted neighborhoods. And so with that understanding, can you share with us uh, your perception of how this continues to impact our community? Well, uh, you know, if we start with what's happening in the West End, um, you, could, you can imagine that gentrification, it's on its way. It starts with displacement and then replacement. And what's being replaced is not what was there. You know, the West Ten is a prime example of a community, a black community that has been torn to pieces time and time again. The highway, Hope Six, uh, uh, the, the Choice Neighborhoods Grant. Here, time and time again, uh, the West End is being targeted um, for, for takeover. Now this particular opportunity for um, developers is a spillover from Over the Rhine. Now Over the Rhine is championed as one of the greatest uh, development projects in the country. Um, and there's minimal, minimal talk about how gentrifying the great development project in Over the Rhine has been. Um, 
if you go, if you look at Walnut Hills, in Walnut Hills, the same type of gentrification is occurring. Uh, if you were to Madisonville, you, you would not uh, recognize Madisonville today um, compared to Madisonville uh, 10 years ago. Now, some of these things are okay, but there's not an intentionality behind uh, ensuring um, a class mix. There's not an intentionality around ensuring a racial mix here in our neighborhood uh, where, you know, over a hundred, uh, uh, over $10 billion of investment is going on right now. The question about gentrification is a daily one. But we, what we've tried to do is be intentional about keeping a black neighborhood a black neighborhood. So in Avondale, there are about 10,000 uh, folk and 90% of them are African-American. The neighborhood geography is big enough for say 20,000. So the question is, as you grow the neighborhood, how do you, uh, without being constitutionally uh, in, you know, um, flawed, how do you grow the neighborhood and continue to have a black neighborhood? I, and I think there's a way to do that. So, so you can really say, hey, we want at least 75% of the people in this neighborhood to be black. Then you get into a, you know, a better or more diverse neighborhood, but it's still a black neighborhood. What, what, without having this conversation, then you start to develop white neighborhoods in old black places. And it's unfortunate that the conversation in of itself creates uh, you know, a lack, it, it, it creates uneasiness in folk when the result keeps happening over and over. It's gonna be first a racial gentrification and then the skyrocketed pricing. You know, as housing prices go up, and you know the the price of the, you know of folks' wages are not going up, so we're not. That's not helping us at all. So it's definitely gentrification is definitely going on, and it's going to continue to go on if we don't um, if we don't have those conversations in advance with developers, with municipalities, uh, and with the current resident in these neighborhoods. Well, we're definitely going to lean on individuals like yourself uh, and, and for us to support us to continue to have these conversations so it can bring about um, change uh, so we don't have this reoccurring story. Um, Ozzy, I'm going to ask you to hold on with us. Um, and so uh, definitely we want to have the opportunity. We're going to bring you back in along with the others um, uh, to, to continue our panel discussion. Um, and so I want to kind of pivot a little bit to talk a little bit about Chicago. Um, and so uh, the Cabrini Green housing project was a Chicago housing project located in the city's near north side neighborhood. Uh, the project uh, was authorized by the Housing Act of 1937. Uh, the Francis Cabrini Homes completed in 19, 1942 was the first major public housing project in Chicago and the first section of what eventually would be called Carbini uh, Green project. Uh, it held 586 units, um, which were initially provided for soldiers temporarily stationed in Chicago during World War II and replacement housing for those who had formerly lived in the neighborhood that was demolished to allow construction for this project. Initially, the Francis Cabrini Homes had a quota for African-American residents. That quota was abandoned as the African-American population in Chicago nearly doubled in size between 1940 and 1950. And because white Chicagoans remained opposed to integrated housing in their neighborhoods, as we talked about, as Josh mentioned, uh, the idea that mixed neighborhoods are bad. Uh, and so this is this prevailing theme that we continue to deal with. Uh, with the passage of the 1949 Housing Act, which approved another of new public housing construction, the Cabrini uh, Extension, a high rise of uh, consisting of 1,921 units was authorized. The project was completed in 1958, followed by the nearby William Green Homes, another high rise building with 1,099 units, which was opened in 1962. All three projects became known as the Cabrini Green and was the first example of high rise public housing, primarily for the African-American community in Chicago. Now we're gonna see a short trailer of 70 acres in Chicago, Cabrini Green. 
this is some valuable, valuable land. And it's been valuable, valuable for a long, long time. And you got folks who, who had their eyes on this land, who want this land, they salivating. You know, they drooling at the lip. Because they want this land. Mayor Daly is moving us out to get um, higher class people in. That's how I see it. People who can pay more money. This is the largest transformation of public housing in the world. No one else wanted to tackle this issue because it's very complex and it's very difficult and uh, deals mostly with poverty people. Yeah, but aren't you supposed to be relocated to this area? <laughs> That's what they tell us. Do I believe them? No. When Cabrini Green residents started coming in, there's a sentiment of, we feel like we're being outnumbered. And I don't know if it was more of an outnumbered by black people or if it was more just outnumbered by people who weren't middle class. Some people get it. Some people really understand that, that they have to set an example for people who don't know what it's like to earn a living and to, to be proud of yourself and be proud of what you have. There was this whole belief that if so-called public housing residents, if they move next door to such affluent neighbors, that would make them better people, which was very insulting. I think there's a rage when you, when you grow up and you know a community, you see that community get torn down, and then you see new people come in who expect things to change and expect you to change and say there's something wrong with you. Here we go. Step, step, side, side, side. round and round. Now bring it down, now separate, then bring it up. Can't get enough, can't get enough. Step, step, side, side, round and round. Watch out now. Many of us fought against change, and somewhere along the line, we understood that change is inevitable. And so, how do you prepare for change? And that got to be the bigger picture. How do you prepare for change? Then bring left and front. Now you step in. Step, step, side, 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 round and round. Now bring it down, now separate. Then bring it up. Can't get enough, can't get enough. So at this time, joining us in this conversation is Ranit Bazalo. Uh, she is an accomplished filmmaker who has been creating social issue documentary films for more than two decades. Her, her award-winning film, Voices of Cabrini, remaking Chicago's public housing in 1999, received a John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Award to uh, catalyze dialogue about the horrible housing issues in Chicago neighborhoods. And she is also the filmmaker of the trailer we just saw, 70 Acres. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. It's such an honor to be here. And it's an honor to hear everyone talk and my work links uh, to what we've all been discussing. So thank you. Absolutely. So I, I, my first question is very simple. What compelled you? to get involved with telling this, this story about Cabrini Green um, and how has it been received? Okay, thank you. So this all started in 1994. And at that time I moved from Montreal, Canada to sh Chicago to attend film school at Columbia College. And the first thing I noticed about Chicago was the racial segregation. And not just the racial segregation, but uh, the people in my circles weren't talking about it. It was just assumed this is the way the city is. I was, I took the train every day to school and uh, from the window I could see Cabrini Green. It was a place that at school we were actually told to avoid and I wanted to know why was this place being so maligned, so stereotyped in the middle of the city, um, yet we weren't supposed to go there. And at the same time they started to um, tear down Cabrini Green and uh, being a filmmaker I wanted to know more and so I met a man called Mark Pratt who was featured in the film and he was also a student at Columbia College and I told him I wanted to know more about his community and he would brought me into the community and I learned more and I knew I wanted to make a film and I was motivated by the sense of injustice that I saw. The community was being torn down, thousands of African Americans were going to be displaced from the city center from their homes 
And although the city said that people would be allowed to come back, I knew that that wouldn't be true. This is replaying of what we've been discussing about history. It was so blatant. It was the largest, um, part of the largest redevelopment of public housing in the world. And some of the things that we've been talking about, Hope Six, Housing Choice Vouchers, those were all the terms that were being thrown around with a promise that people could come back. And so I actually documented this for 20 years, from 1994 to 2015. And so we really followed the arc of the demolition of the 23 buildings of Cabrini Green, the displacement of where people, uh, where, where people went and it wasn't back at Cabrini Green and to really document what was being happening to a black community in the city center. So I wanted to create a historical record and a celebration of the Cabrini Green community. The film has been very well received. Um, I was happy that uh, people from Cabrini Green, number one, really liked the film and felt that it was a record, a history, um, visual documentation of a community that doesn't exist in the same way. There's still one street left at Cabrini Green, so I always wanna, tell people that there's still a Cabrini Green, it's just very tiny at this point. It's also been watched by a variety of additional audiences, including urban planners, architects, students from all disciplines, public health professional, elective officials, and people um, watch it because they wanna understand about Chicago's plan for transformation, how it went wrong, and how that they can avoid pitfalls in their own communities. Wow, and I was telling you earlier, um, my first introduction to Cabrini Green was uh, the 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 cinematic thriller Candyman, <laughs> um, and 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 if anyone's seen the the uh, the new version that came out released this fall, it touched on these dynamics about gentrification, um, and it's amazing how um, that that piece of work was also meaningful in that way to spark conversation. I, I, I'm curious if you can share with us some stories about the families that were displaced. Um, you know, how were their lives impacted um, by the, 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 you know, by the Cabrini Green being um, basically pretty much uh, destroyed for the most part? Mm -hmm. And what the film does, the film shows different um, families who were displaced. So there was Mark Pratt, and he was living at Cabrini um, with his family, and he his family was too large to be able to move back into the new mixed income homes because he had... Um, a number of children that, and um, the new homes mostly were like two bedrooms or three bedrooms and it wasn't for large families. So he elected to move out of Cabrini Green. He moved far away from the city center, far away from public transportation, from his job, um, from the community. And his is a familiar tale of um, families being torn apart, families being displaced, moved from all the, um, from the stores, from what people know. And um, there's also Deirdre Brewster. So Deirdre Brewster moved back into the mixed income community. So back on Cabrini Green land. But for folks that moved back, it was totally different. Even though it was the same land, it wasn't the same community. And um, in that case, there were a lot of rules and regulations. Deirdre talked about having to be drug tested first to move in and then a yearly drug test, which was very, very insulting. Wait, um, can, I, can, I, can I stop you right there right yes. quickly? Everybody, everybody, the mixed neighborhood, everybody would have to get drug tested or specifically individuals? So basically, if you were a renter, so mm -hmm. you could be a renter that used to live at Cabrini Green, or theoretically a renter that didn't live from didn't live at Cabrini Green, but were now renting. If you owned a home in the mixed income communities, because it was a mixture of rental and home ownership, you did not have to have a drug test. So it created such an inequality. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That I'm sorry. I just had to, to clarify yeah. that. Wow. Yeah. And so uh, yes, please proceed. No, no, no. Go ahead. And, and so definitely you talked about how they were impacted. So is the individual, is she still living there under those circumstances? Well, Deirdre unfortunately passed away last year, okay. And, um, okay. but she was still living there. And she was very vocal about being um, in on the condo board and being part of the decision-making of the community. She was a very strong activist. Um, yeah. Okay. 
Well, I want to thank you, Rodney, for, first of all, being part of our conversation and also this film. Um, uh, I, I'm definitely going to take the time to uh, uh, to see the, the, the film in its entirety um, and, and get to know. It's, I think we need to make ourselves aware. I know that the uh, the premise for this, we say unconscious and conscious bias or conscious and unconscious bias, but it seems to be more conscious. It's very intentional. Um, and so at this time, I want to actually bring the rest of our panel back on to, to video, if you don't mind, so that we can continue this conversation. I also want to encourage people um, who are joining us, if you have any questions whatsoever, please feel free to put those questions in the chat. Uh, we will also have a survey link uh, that we will want you to fill out at the completion of the program. Your feedback will be greatly, greatly appreciated. Um, but we definitely will continue this conversation. Um, I'm going to try to uh, also be uh, looking at the chat um, at the same time. But I want to, and anyone can chime in with this. Um, we talked about we're raising these issues. Um, um, I guess my question is, what action can we take uh, to make sure that there are more equitable matters when it comes to urban planning? Or is it so rooted um, that the, the, the defeat is, is too great? I guess that's my question. I, I'm, I'm going to be like Brian Stevens, Stevenson and guard my hope. Um, but but I'm wanting to hear from you uh, collectively. What 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 action needs to take place? Well, well, Chris, I, I you know, I think we're we're at an apropos time for, um, and and I think there's a willingness amongst uh, urban planners and uh, community development specialists to be more intentional about. Um, you know, developments in, in particularly in black neighborhoods or neighborhoods that have been majority black and are usually, you know, around center city or around downtown. Um, and with, with, with that willingness, you really have to have the conversation up front and, and, and have some desires for equity or it's not gonna just happen, money alone won't allow it to just happen. And I, I think, but I, I, I do really feel like there is a, um, there's a, we're at a really good time because of all the pain. And these, these neighborhoods are very resilient. Um, but we have, we, we have to force the uh, conversation and, and, de and really determine that, that that's what we want. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, the one thing, uh, and, and I want to allow everyone can respond to that as well. Uh, and this goes back to, I, I keep going back to this point, and I want us to think about this. The idea of mixed neighborhoods are bad. And I intentionally see that to where you either have predominantly Hispanic neighborhoods, predominantly Black neighborhoods, predominantly white neighborhoods, it's almost like it's entrenched in us to, to having a mixed neighborhood. And I forced me to look at my street to where I live. And surprisingly, the street where I live on is actually a mixed neighborhood, totally. Uh, we have a, 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 a family from Nepal on the same block. Uh, a, a family from Africa. Uh, we have, you know, um, whites of all, I mean, young, old. Um, we just, uh, and, and, and of course, you know, we have probably about, I would say about seven to eight black families as well. And so I see that mix on my street. And so maybe I get somewhat, uh, <laughs> I'm looking through, I see this rose colored lens when I step outside of my front door, because I see that. But the reality is that is very rare. And so is it possible to have a mixed neighborhood? I mean, beyond, I guess my street, I'm not gonna say my street name because I don't want y'all to come by. <laughs> or, or you can, uh, on Highwood Lane, it absolutely is a, a mixed neighborhood. But, but so I guess that's my question about that. 
I mean, I appreciate the question, Christopher, and I think it goes back to the comments I made earlier regarding safety, right? And when we look at our neighbors, are we viewing one another through a lens of understanding that we might experience that differently? When we look at segregation, um, you know, and integration and understand the um, social aspects as well as the uh, emotional impacts of being the only in a neighborhood, right? Or the first to integrate a neighborhood and the harm that that may cause in some aspects, but also realizing that it has to be a, a cultural shift and understanding what it means to experience a sense of belonging and value at a deep humanistic level for, for people in humanity more broadly speaking and understanding biases and stereotypes that individuals uh, uh, might have about uh, various communities. And so I think that it moves beyond just who's living where, but it, under, it uh, no pun intended, calibrating our lens to see the ways in which we view people and communities based on stereotypical images and dismantling those things to ensure that we're not perpetuating much of the harm that we've seen time and time again uh, in mixed neighborhoods. A great example of that uh, that I've seen recently is the Colin Kaepernick um, uh, show on Netflix, right? And he talks about his experiences there. And so being in a mixed neighborhood is not always a, the healthiest, uh, if not uh, for the individuals that are there understanding their behaviors and the way that their views could potentially be harmful to others. Thank you, thank you. Um, one of the questions I see from the chat um, I want to address um, is talking about um, rejuvenating the uh, housing um, when uh, you had this deteriorating uh, the deterioration that is taking place. And so, and so you're looking at this depleted neighborhood. And so they're going to revitalize the neighborhood, but then it's being revitalized, but it's also changing the demographic of the neighborhood. And so, and so the question is, how can a neighborhood be salvaged without that taking place? Well, I, I think there has to be a commitment that whoever is displaced can come back in. And it's acknowledged that with Chicago's plan for transformation, they did it too quickly. They tore down all the, or all the buildings and didn't, um, what they should have done is torn down a building and then had people come back in instead of just tearing down everything. It was too quick on scope. And so I think it's about the pace that you do it and your intentionality that you're going to bring people back folks at Cabrini Green said, you know, we don't mind if you're going to, you know, give us a new building or give us a new neighborhood and give us amenities, uh, you know, the, a library and grocery stores, that's all great. It's just and with the, what, what was lacking was the intentionality to bring people back so they could actually come back and enjoy all of the new amenities in the neighborhood. Mm. Thank you for that. So, so, so you talked about the process. Um, and I think everybody wants to live in, in, in the best, you know, living environment as well, regardless of race. And so that's very interesting that the process was just, just very, was done very quick. Mm -hmm. Chris, you know, when you were, when you were um, detailing your street, I had a vision that you were talking about a lot of homeowners. Like I, you I, are did, correct. I didn't, I didn't sense you were talking about uh, any renters and well, uh, I take that back. We do have two renters on our block, absolutely, but but predominantly, mostly, yes, homeowners, yes. Yeah, the 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 mix that has been uh, most difficult in my experience has been the homeowner renter mix, and um, it's a different it's a different culture between owning and renting. You know, I live across the street for from where I grew up. Uh, in a in an apartment, so you know I've only lived on one street for fifty six years. So <laughs> this house I live in is called White Mike's because the 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 Havlins, the White family, grew, moved on the street in nineteen seventy, and they were like the Partridge family. And to this day, Mike is my dearest friend. What happens is the renter and the homeowner don't have the same um, value proposition. 
there is a different amount of, uh, uh, let's say ownership, like actual, I feel like this is my street where the renter may be passing through. You know, they, they, they may not have the same stake. And I think that mix is the mix that creates uh, the necessity for intentional conversation in advance. Even as we start to deliberate how you keep neighborhoods from gentrifying. Well, you have to understand what's your, your mix. And, and, and say like in Avondale, we've 25% home ownership. And we've got to, you know, we got to determine what is the, the target. And I think Russ, who is our CDC uh, leader is thinking, hey, can we get the 40%? Can we get the 40% home ownership and how? And let's look at that racial mix. And let's also look at, can we get residents that are currently say living in, let's say they're living in uh, housing authority uh, properties today. Can we get them the home ownership in four years so that they don't have to leave? <laughs> because if everybody new is coming in from outside, you're going to gentrify the neighborhood, no matter if it's, uh, a racial gentrification, or if it's just a pure economic gentrification. we got to have that intentionality. Absolutely. Um, I want to uh, ask this question. This is coming from the chat. I want to ask Josh, uh, since, uh, you know, you dedicated a lot of research to this. And so the question is, um, it was pretty long, but it comes down to, uh, are there any success stories of exclusionary housing policies that we can look to as a model to like, okay, this was successful. Have you run across any of that with your research? Yeah, you know, and I always get that question. And, and I, I don't know where it originates from. I think it originates from this desire to have a solution. Like there's one thing we can point to that they did and then we can do that thing and it's gonna be successful. And it just, it just doesn't work like that, unfortunately. And so uh, there are, and, and those are questions of scale. Right, so we, we do know there are small scale interventions where land has been taken off the speculative market and redistributed to people so that they're able to stay. We have a lot of examples of collective ownership models and, and, and things like reparations have been on the table for years. And so those are the type of conversations that we really need to have, but we also have to acknowledge that in this country, we, you know, we're all existing in the same market. And so the logic of that market plays out across every city. And so you, you, that's why a lot of these stories from different cities sound very similar and sound the same. But as far as one thing we could point to, to say, okay, they did it right. I mean, there are good examples such as Jackson, Mississippi, where they have a lot of collective ownership and things like that we can point to, uh, but there's not one solution or one thing. And I would discourage us from even thinking in those terms, that, that these are systems that are to be analyzed and studied uh, but no, there's not, there's not one place that got it right. I mean, racism is everywhere. You know, it's not, you know, go to, go to Washington, go to New York, go to the Southwest, it's, it's the same. And so it, it sounds like you're saying that although similar actions are being taken place, it's not gonna be a cookie cutter, cookie cutter type of response or a resistance toward this. It's, you have to kind of handle each circumstance on its own, it sounds like. Would that be correct? That's correct. And I just saw that someone put in the chat uh, that they would recommend The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. And uh, I'm going to be a fly in the buttermilk on this panel, but I would actually not recommend that book. I think reading Richard Rothstein is part of the problem because Richard Rothstein views this matter as one of segregation, that Black people were kept out of white neighborhoods. And if you listen to Rothstein, he's not, he is uh, not in favor of reparations. His solution is simply that Black people can move to the suburbs, and when they move to the suburbs, everything is going to be okay. And it's a very uh, shallow take on an issue. I would much prefer, I would much rather see people read something like uh, W. E. B. Du Bois' Black Reconstruction, or something from a black scholar that actually provides an analysis of how capitalism and racial capitalism actually function. Thank you, thank you for that. I read that actually uh, by W. E. B. Du Bois, and so um, one of the questions. Uh, and, and Habitat for Humanity, um, uh, the question is, how do, do you see nonprofits such as Habitat for Humanity helping with this situation? Uh, is that moving the needle at all or not?
I think, you know, I think there are different levels of intervention. And so, you know, the intervention they make is at an individual level. And so we need, we need service delivery at an individual level every day. We need policy change. Uh, but, in, but the impact that we can actually make at an individual level comes far short of the impact we need to make. So, as you know, black people were not harmed as individuals. They, you know, we, 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 black people were harmed collectively. And so our interventions have to be collective. But I want to I want to say a little bit about the profession of urban planning because I think uh, that's you know that's what I can contribute the most and so when we talk about urban planning, uh, we're talking about two things. We're talking about communities that are living under systemic oppression who are surviving and thriving every day, and I also recognize that as urban planning, very grassroots urban planning that often exists in opposition to the professionalization of urban planning, and so. You know, I live in Louisville right now. Uh, I, we can't talk about any of these issues without putting it in the context of the Breonna Taylor murder and recognizing that that we still don't have justice for Breonna Taylor, one, and that two, Breonna Taylor was murdered due to development-driven policing, place-based policing or place-based investigation, which you all also have in Cincinnati, which is a really dangerous, violent uh, 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 way of, of policing, right? You, it's, it's LA, Stop LAPD Spine calls it speculative policing, where entire communities and groups of people can be criminalized simply for their proximity to an, a, a supposed offender. So it happened in that context. And also as a part of that development plan, uh, two urban planning programs were connected to that, where they were actually developing design plans. I think anyone that's gone through planning school knows, you develop these design plans as a student, and then you show them to investors to try to leverage money and that's how that's what we're trained to do and so we have to talk about the complicity of urban planning in this and the profession the complicity of academic in the academics in terms of how we're trained to be urban planners because those those plans exist within the logic of the market you know I, I went to urban planning school I was an urban planner for five years I was trained to be in service to developers I was not trained to be in service to black communities black communities do not need my expertise because they already hold it and so that's what the planner's job is to really manage and sort of manufacture consent in the community to get these plans approved. Um, and so there was a recent study that was done uh, by the U of L uh, capstone program where they actually tried to deal with, you know, racism in urban planning. And they wrote, a, they wrote a report about it. And it was interesting because in the report, their solution is, well, we need to hire more black planners. And we do, I don't want to dismiss that, but we can't, uh, we can't think that we're going to now allow black people into this racist system and the onus of responsibility in changing is changing that in changing that system falls on them. It's, it's a ridiculous notion. And so we have to think about what Ruth Wilson Gilmore calls life affirming systems. That's what that's what she uh, uh, that's how she defines abolition. And so we have to think about the, the abolition of these systems like policing, like urban planning that are rooted in settler colonialism, that are rooted in chattel slavery and transfer over power to communities to make their own decisions. And I think that's really, you know, we, we have to dissolve that professionalization and, and, and work through a way to not just hand over material resources, redistribute land, but also redistribute political control in that process also. I, I, see, I see you nodding, Jennifer, you wanna to add to that? <laughs> I, I think that so often we talk about um, getting to solutions without first deeply understanding the root cause of the issue and the problem. And I just appreciate Josh going back. Um, this is true within the workplace. This is true in so many instances where we talk about the need to diversify without first understanding the root cause issues in the culture that oftentimes is toxic and the toxicity that causes harm and the ways in which we have individuals that could be present without the power they have inherent power, we all do, but without the political or the social power and capital needed to really influence and bring about the changes that we talk about. So simply diversifying will not solve these issues across any vast degree of the spectrum, right? Without first understanding the ways in which we have to look at the root cause issues and get to a space of power and what it means to start to dismantle some of the systems. I heard Angela Davis speak at NKU last year during the pandemic, and she talks extensively about how we can't look to modify these systems. We need to transform these systems if we are to truly see 
uh, uh, the, the outcomes that we are hoping to see. The systems are doing exactly what they were designed to do and simply tweaking or modifying them slightly will not transform or produce uh, a more equitable or inclusive future uh, based on how we have historically operated. And so just to put it a little bit more direct, I think what we're talking about is the system itself by design is racist and is uh, unhealthy. So therefore it needs to be uprooted <laughs> It needs to be replaced with something that's going to be healthy and void of those systemic racist values that it holds. Um, and that takes a great deal of headlifting, a great deal of uncomfortable conversations that we know that a lot of people are reluctant to have, especially when you see uh, uh, all these school boards talking about getting rid of see the critical race theory that doesn't exist in the school, but just want to, to kind of want to, to avoid having this conversation about race. And I've often said this before is that um, the reality is that race has, has played a significant role in every sector of our society. The moment we can acknowledge that truth and start to deal with it, then we can start going down the road of, of, of changing. But if you have people, you know, uh, that don't recognize that truth, um, it makes it a hard task. Um, I want to take this time. I know that in the chat we are getting close to uh, to to, um, to closing. Um, I know Josh. A few people asked how they can get a hold of you. If you can, if there's like a site that you can put up to where uh, they can get a hold of you, that would be great. Um, Jennifer, with your work um, as well as Ozzy, if there's in information that people want to connect with you, if you could put that in the chat, that would be greatly appreciated. And Ronit, um, if there is people want to do a screening of, of 70 acres. Um, could you put that information in the chat of how people can um, possibly have the opportunity uh, to have that screening? That would be greatly appreciated. And so those that are on, I would ask for you to, to look to the chat for that information. Um, and so um, at this time, uh, any closing remarks that um, I'm kind of open up to the panel um, for any closing remarks they want to provide on this matter or any, I, I will say this, I know that, I guess I'll close out on this. Actually, Jennifer and um, Ozzy, you were at a groundbreaking ceremony today, I believe. Uh, could you tell us a little bit what that was about? Because I think that's related to uh, what we're discussing. Well, actually, you know, uh, and I, you know, I'm I'm very interested in Jennifer's pers um, you know perspective here. It, it was actually fabulous this morning. Uh, the Avondale Development Corporation, uh, working with Lisk, the Cincinnati Development Fund, First Financial Bank, a, a host of of the city's finest um, in regards to putting big development deals together. Um, you know, have a woman-led, black woman-led project, a black woman architect, a young black brother, a first time development company, a black construction company in a big black neighborhood. It, it, was, it was quite, uh, it was done very intentionally. The young lady that uh, is leading this initiative has been working in Avondale redevelopment for over 20 years. Her name's Maria Collins. She worked with Jim King in the Avondale Redevelopment Corporation way before uh, we started the Avondale Development Co uh, Corporation 10 years ago. And I think this is the type of intentionality that we're talking about. Uh, Web Ventures, the Avondale Community Council, ADC, they wanted to have a project. And at the end of the day, it's about uh, first time home buyers, and they're going to really be prospecting current residents in the neighborhood, trying to move them into a new station, a new place, a, a, a place of progress. But I, I really, you know, because I live here, and it's like, it was very special for me. I really want to know, like, Jennifer's perspective um, of, of that project. I appreciate you inviting me into the conversation, Ozzy, and 
as an outsider uh, whom Cincinnati has embraced. Uh, it was extremely special uh, to be a part of this day. Um, it, there were black people that had the power that I talked about to make these decisions and to manifest this moment. Diversity is happening. Inclusion is intentional. And Ozzy, I hope that you, you, you are uh, open to me challenging your point around intentionality. We've got to be deliberate. We have to challenge these notions uh, uh, of um, being intentional and be deliberate about how we're making decisions to be able to uh, do just that shift in that power. I, I uh, had the great pleasure. And so um, I'm very humbled. Kai is working with me as owner's rep to protect my interest in, in some of our real estate efforts. And so it was also extremely uh, humbling for me to be a part of that and watching him rise. We have to support one another. We have to be a part of this holistically and understanding that it's not just him showing up as owner's rep on my little quad that we're working on. It's me showing up and supporting him in these spaces and us continuing to share with one another. We have black contractors that we are bringing on to our projects. We know that it doesn't stop with uh, who owns a building or who is managing a process. But when you have black owners, we are more likely to employ more black people. <laughs> and so looking at this holistically and knowing that this is happening in Avondale, uh, for me, Ozzy, you know, it was just so um, uh, uh, rich and uh, it was an honor to be there and to witness it and be a part of um, this process. Well, I just want to take the time to thank all of you, uh, Ranit, uh, Josh, uh, OZ, and Jennifer, thank you so much for being a part of this conversation. Um, we do have a survey link um, that was posted. Uh, we will repost that. We ask that you please um, uh, click on the survey link um, and let us know your thoughts about this program. We also want everyone to know that we are of the business of continuing to bring these conversations, um, hopefully when we can in person, um, but also uh, through webinar. Um, and so we want to engage in these critical conversations so that we can better change our communities to build uh, uh, better thinkers and good decision makers, uh, because that is needed in order to move our communities forward. Uh, join us on December 7th, where we will have a wonderful conversation reconsidering Angela Davis uh, with four scholars from four different universities. Uh, you can go to freedomcenter.org uh, to get information about that program and more. For those that are not members of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, we wanna encourage you to be a member of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. Your membership helps support us uh, in doing the work of having these conversations and working with great individuals uh, that you've been a part of listening to here today. Thank the, I wanna once again, thank this wonderful panel. Uh, all of you be safe. Thank all of you for joining us and have a blessed day. Thank you. <laughs>